blessed with the mighty Atlantic Ocean, fertile agricultural lands, and a strategic geographic location that gives an opportunity for a lot of people to explore and get into the business. Gunjur and the Gambia at large has experienced uh, numerous uh, shutdowns when it comes to economy, and especially this COVID time. Please join us as we embark on a journey where we explore different areas of our business sector, from agriculture, fisheries, and small business enterprises. Gunjur business is in short called Gunjur Biz. This will be a platform that we will use to explore different business opportunities, especially for young people. We'll bring you on Gunjul Online all the business topics that is related to financing, operations, marketing. And we will use this platform to invite experts from different sectors of the gambling economy and give tips and have a broader analysis of the general business sector. This will give us an opportunity to be able to discuss in a broader detail how businesses are affected when it comes to our environment, our natural resources being exploited by other people, but also how we can tap into the opportunities and also access capital, which is very crucial for the success of the businesses. But not only that, we won't stop at accessing capital. You know what else we're going to do? It's about the little operational processes that are needed in our business culture to build up cultures that is going to be successful. And that's going to be most importantly what? It's going to be sustainable for the success of the business. So we can transfer wealth. We can also transfer skills from one person to another to be able to live in a community that is thriving, a community that businesses, private sector, individual businesses, no job, entrepreneurship, and reward them. So please join me every week on Guju Online as we delve into all these areas of discussions when it comes to business success. This is your host of our podcast, Control Online. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Omar, how are you? Hello? Okay, uh, I think Omar is busy. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you very clearly. Uh, hello, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, hello, um, esteemed viewers of Gunjur News Online. Welcome to another e episode of um, Daily COVID-19 Updates. But today is another special um, edition. Today is World's Environment Day. Um, just to speak, and um, I have uh, important guests in the passing of Omar Saho and Dr. Malan Dinjete, inshallah, should join us, and Farmer Adrami, they are join, um, they're going to join us a little bit late. Uh, but just as usual, um, we are right in the middle of um, a major uh, pandemic, and yes, it's true, the numbers are coming down in developed countries, but uh, now we have new episodes center that is uh, South uh, Latin America and also Africa the numbers are not going down so it's important we keep reminding ourselves we are still in the middle of a major pandemic and also this pandemic have a very very uh, significant implication on our environment that is what uh, highlighting today and in my introduction I will um, uh, touch on that but for now I'm going to give you the statistic um, how we stand with COVID-19 uh, before we continue uh, with this um, uh, brilliant panel discussion. Um, as you are all aware, this pandemic started in China, in Wuhan um, city, in the Hubei provinces in December 2019. And so far, 6,767,778 people are infected and 395,258 dead. Number of people recovered is 3,297,363. And currently, a uh, number of people with COVID-19 infection stands at 3,075,150. And 
out of that um, 3 million 21,550 uh, in mild condition and 53,000 um, and 607 are in intensive care. Uh, those are the people with um, severe or high or, or, or critical conditions. And I'm going to read to you the top 10 most affected countries in the world uh, since this pandemic start. And unfortunately, these are top um, um, world most uh, developed nations. Uh, past 24 hours, um, numbers recorded for these countries, America recorded 9,646 cases and 404 um, dead. Uh, Brazil recorded um, 6,007 um, new cases and 173 dead, and Russia recorded um, 8,726 cases and 144. And Spain recorded 318 cases and one um, death. And UK recorded 1,650 uh, new cases and 357 dead. And India recorded 9,288 new cases, 256 dead. And Italy recorded 518 cases, 850. Uh, 518 new cases, 85 dead, and Germany recorded 413 and 22 dead. But the numbers surrounding Gambia are still going up, and as long as these numbers are going up, Gambia is not out of the woods yet. So even though Gambia is opening up internally, I think the borders need to remain closed uh, for some time before uh, we see numbers going down in our neighboring countries. Past 24, Senegal recorded 134 new cases. And so far, they recorded 4,155. And Guinea Conakry recorded uh, 58 new cases, past 24 hours, and 3,991 3, so far. And Ivory Coast recorded 152 new cases and 3,262. Um, cases so far since the uh, outbreak start. And Mali recorded uh, 24 new cases past 24 hours, and 485, they rec 1,485 they recorded so far. The numbers for the past 24 hours for uh, Guinea-Bissau are not yet out, but um, so far they recorded 1,338 cases. And Burkina Faso recorded one case past 24 hours, and their total number now stands at 885. And Sierra Leone recorded um, 15 new cases, and their total number stands at 929. So that's the update for COVID-19. We are going into uh, today's discourse, uh, which is World's Environmental Day. Um, Today is World Environmental Day is uh, been celebrated every year since 1974 on the 5th of um, June. But the day was actually designated in 1972 as a World Environmental Day is a couple of years time in 1974 when the whole world uh, joined in. And the day becomes so popular now um, is taking turns for countries to host it. Uh, this year is Colombia. Uh, in collaboration with Germany. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction about this date, then I will let real environmentalists to come in. We hope by the time I finish, Farmara and Dr. Malanding should join. Um, now I'm going to World Environmental Day, all about history, significance of the day, and the theme this year I will be discussing. Um, the, the environment that we live in, as you all know, is very, very important, not only for our health, but our survival as well. So there is a huge need for us to protect it. Um, we will not be able to survive if we do not have clean air, water, and that's why World Environmental Day, um, every year we reminded ourselves about how precious our environment is. You know, celebrations were held annually uh, from 1974, as I said earlier on, to mark this day. And then in 1987, it was decided the center for the activities should be rotated so that uh, different countries can, ho can host it. Sorry, I need to... Uh, 
just go this way. Yeah, so that different countries uh, can host it. And the main idea behind making Junfis as a World Environmental Day is so that, sorry, I lost something. Uh, Yeah, sorry, I lost my slide temporarily. So. Yeah, basically, um, what I was um, explaining was that uh, these days is very, very important that uh, to keep us uh, reminding the whole world every year, um, they are supposed to be a, a designated day in which we all come together as one and remind ourselves about the importance of uh, the environment. So that's why um, today uh, we are here to, to remind ourselves about the environment. And today, this year's theme is about um, celebrating biodiversity. I'm sorry, excuse me, but I lost uh, my slide. So um, earlier on, I was watching uh, the, the minister and the uh, British High Commission, and it was a very, very interesting uh, discussion. And this lady, I must give her credit, she did a very, very good job. She uh, asked some very, very uh, pertinent questions, which ministers sometimes are those very well, but um, sometimes not very well. So to continue with my own slide, um, the idea behind making June 5 World Environmental Day so that we are aware of the, what is needed to be done to protect our environment. This day raises awareness, it's about raising awareness about the environmental issues like global warming, marine pollution, human overpopulation, and protection of wildlife and sustainable consumption of our natural resources. You know, the, the celebration has spread so far and wide, and that um, World Environmental Day has become a global platform for countries to reach eyes to the public. So that's the reason we are here today as well. So for 2020, um, the theme for World Environmental Day is to celebrate biodiversity, which as per the United Nations, a concern that is both urgent and existential. And citing the recent events taking place in Brazil, the US, Australia and Africa, the global COVID-19 pandemic. It is said it all, all demonstrate the international uh, interdependence of humans and the world on wildlife in which they exist. So as has been happening every year, um, Colombia this year has been choosing as the country to host the World Environment Day 2020 event in collaboration with Germany. And last year it had been hosted by China and the team had been bit air pollution. We all know China is very, very notorious uh, for um, the air quality, um, also air pollution. So it was fitting uh, to uh, give it to China last year and also make the team about air pollution. So um, World Environmental Day 2020 uh, is about positive impact of COVID-19 uh, lockdown on environment. So this year's World Environmental Day is about celebrating biodiversity, but this year um, World Environmental Celebration will not be completed without mentioning uh, the impact of um, 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 uh, COVID-19. You know, you can ask a question, is COVID-19 a godsend? Well, I might not have the answer, but I know it has a very, very positive impact on our environment. Unfortunately, it has to take um, a worldwide pandemic for us to see the significant um, um, uh, positive uh, effect on our environment. Uh, following the outbreak of the coronavirus, uh, many countries had adopted lockdown procedures and that stopped people from moving out and for subs and other establishments to close down. And as World Environmental um, um, Nears, uh, we take a, I'm going to take a look at the positive impact the COVID-19 lockdown has on our environment. Um, the 
uh, Swiss celebrate World Environmental Day 2020. I'm going to take a brief look, brief look at the positive impact the COVID-19 lockdown has on our environments. So a bit about World Environmental Day, you know, I'm going to repeat some things again. It was first held in 1974 and celebrated every year since then on June 5th. And just this is just to encourage awareness and actions for the protection of the environment. And it stood for raising awareness about issues related to um, environment like air pollution, marine pollution, global warming, and all that. So before um, the start of the COVID-19 pa uh, pandemic, the air around us had been deemed very, very toxic to breathe and due to the amount of greenhouse gases that had been emitted uh, over the centuries. So the earth faced rising temperatures, which in turn lead to the melting of glaciers and rising of sea levels. So environmental degradation was happening first due to the depletion of resources such as air, water, and soil. But after the coronial lockdown commenced, there have been slight changes in the environment. We all notice that, uh, especially if you live in major cities. So after the lockdown, um, um, uh, the, the uh, effect of COVID-19 on air quality, after the lockdown was put in place, many countries, there was lesser traveling done by people, whether it by their own cars or by trains or, or by flights. And even industries were closed down and not allowed to function. So this is this don't lead to the pollution in the air uh, uh, um, uh, uh, dropping significantly as there was a marked decline in nitro oxide em emission. COVID-19 on water quality. And since there are no boats, um, whether they be fishing or, 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 or play show ones like the cruise ships or the military uh, ships flying on the rivers and waterways, the water has cleared up. And in areas like uh, Venice, um, uh, where the tourists flock in all the time, you know, the water became so clear that the fish could be seen and there was a better water flow. So no doubt because of the lesser human uh, food form, even the ozones are recovering and marine life is thriving as well. Now, effect of COVID-19 on, on, on wildlife. Again, uh, where fish is concerned, the lockdown has been a decline in fishing, which means that the fish biomass will increase after overfishing almost depleted it. Except in the Gambia, where instead of reducing, we have seen fishing intensify because of the Chinese uh, fish mill factories. So apart from that, animals have been spotted moving about freely where once they would not dare to go. Uh, Omar sent me an article or um, you see it. Um, um, animal, deers, you know, in the streets of London, you know, you see mountain goats in the streets of Wales, you know, in Newport. So um, this shows how um, we marginalize or how we push these animals to the edge. So even sea turtles have been spotted, you know, touring to areas they once avoided to lay their eggs, all due to the lack of human um, interference. And finally, uh, if you COVID-19 on vegetations, plants are growing better because there is a clear, cleaner air and water, and because yet there is no human interference. And with everything at a standstill, plants are allowed to thrive and grow and produce more COVID and oxygen. Less litter also means less blogging of river systems, which is good in the long run of the environments. So in conclusion, to conclude this um, uh, brief introduction, uh, though there has been a positive impact on the environment due to the lockdown, there is fear that once people start traveling again or go back to doing uh, what they have been doing, all the positive income it will, will disappear because you expect people what they lose, um, they will try to recover it it as soon as possible so that means uh, more greenhouse um, gas emissions again as we go omar so that's the brief introduction bakari welcome um, i have um, um here so before uh, dr marlon dinkem and, and farmer uh, and what's your take well my take is starting from 1972 Mm -hmm. There was a meeting in Lamba in, uh, in Stockholm in Sweden called Health and Environment, something like that. You know, it was human health, human environment. So it was from 1972 Human Health Human Health Environment Conference in Stockholm in Sweden that the you know the world political agenda about environment changes that we need to at least increase our actions towards protecting our environmental covers. In 1974, mm -hmm. as you rightly mentioned, they can at least look at key thematic issues like you know ocean pollution. They look at you know 
ozone layer, you know, toxic pollution, chemical desertification, and global warming. How best can we tell that, like, you know, put in the political effort, politicians, you know, government efforts, so that we can all have an action towards putting the environmental covers? Because they have realized that, you know, from, you know, 1970 towards the 1992, there was this Rio Convention. 1997, there was the Kyoto Protocol. They have the Montreal Protocol. All of this are trying to, like, you know, address both the climate action as well as protecting the environmental cover. Because they realize that you know, if we do not have that concerted effort, if we don't have the involvement of the government organizations, the private bodies, the individuals, to raise awareness about some of these issues, our environmental issues are going to go down. Emission is going to increase, and if emission increase, that means we're going to have too much like you know, climate issues. You have talked down about COVID nineteen. COVID nineteen happened in twenty nineteen, but before COVID nineteen, it's poor people, indigenous communities, you know, marginalized and vulnerable communities who are living in poor environmental conditions. They live in near, near natural gas lines. They live near refineries. They live near, you know, landfills. You know, they are the mm -hmm. people that also experience the adverse impact of deforestation because they are the ones whose livelihood depend on environmental resources. So from 1974, 1990, Rio Convention, 1997, Kyoto Protocol, you talk about the Art Summit every year. We are looking at how best governments, harvest civil society organizations, harvest individuals like, you know, ecologists, environmentalists, conservationists, development practitioners can put their hands on the decks to whisper in the environmental cover. Yes, COVID-19 has helped the world in reducing the CO2 emission. But then who are the people who are disproportionate, uh, who are like the majorly impacted? These are people who have like underlying health issues. Where do they get most of those health issues? They are people who live in like in poor environmental conditions in the developed countries, majorly in developed, in developed countries. When we talk about the lockdown also in developing countries, people who depend entirely on environmental are the ones whose livelihood is seriously undermined. Because right now they cannot go down to their gardens. Right now, people who depend on like fisheries for their livelihood, they cannot go and then do some of those activities because of what? Instead of emergency declared in most countries. So if you look at the change of distribution from the coastline to other part of the country, that one is also at some point in time disrupted. So when you talk about environmental you know, protection, you talk about like the World Environment Day, this year is a very crucial moment. We cannot talk about environmental you know, protection without not looking at the intersectionality between environment and racial injustice or social, inju social justice. Because if you think about environment, who are you putting the environment for? We cannot think about environment, you know, with the perspective of like the concrete jungles. Yes, we protect the environment. We have concrete jungles. We have national park. We have like no wetland reserves. Yes, but how does that one support the people whose livelihood depend on those environmental resources? Globally, how is the issue of inequality in terms of environmental conservation? If we want to protect environment, are we promoting environmental conservation for corporate interests? Are we protecting environment to serve the needs of the indigenous communities? Are we trying to come up like nature-based solutions whereby local people can also at least have something whereby they can be incentivized for environmental protection? We have seen in the Gambia recently they have launched the EBA project, which is like the ecosystem-based adaptation project in the Gambia, whereby they want to support you know, rural farmers in the Gambia for them to restore their, their degraded farmlands. Uh -uh. But how do we ensure those things are sustainable? How do we ensure the economic benefit of these conservation projects? It trickles down to the poor people in remote areas in the country. Uh. How do we ensure that corporate institutions in the country that are like you know, manufacturing you know, companies adhere to like strong environmental protocols of environmental permitting in the country? Whereby before they are given the permit to you know develop their factories or their industries, they have to follow due environmental protocols of environment and social impact assessments. How do we ensure that people who want to depend on like deforestation, they cut down the right trees, the right numbers that is going to at least go in line with the forestry project in the country, forestry protocol in the country? So the World Environment Day is a day. Each year, June on the fifth, that is trying to raise awareness about some of those issues. Issue about global warming. Issue about ocean layer depletion. Issue about pollution. Issue about like marine resource conservation. How can the people have that understanding, and knowledge, the awareness about some of these issues? Do we make any substantial progress in trying to protect some of these resources or not? What are some of those pro pro progresses? What need to be done better? Who are the major stakeholders, and how can we ensure that there's a robust 
institutional frameworks, policies that are implemented towards protecting the environmental cover. In contrast to the Gambia, we have seen, yes, yeah. we have got the Wildlife Act, we have got the Name Act in the country, we have got all these environmental policies in the country, all of which are geared towards putting the environmental cover. But if we make an assessment, are we truly protecting the environment in the country from 1965 to now? Yeah. Omar, just one minute, let me welcome uh, Dr. Malandi. You can, you can turn on your camera uh, while Omar, in fact, Omar raised some questions that might interest you. So you can turn on your camera. It's, and, uh, it's, about, it's about our consumption habit. It's about what the national and international environmental policies, how do we ensure from the national level to the international level, we are able to meet our international obligations because we are part of various international environmental conventions. While nationally also, we also want to conserve our environmental resources whereby we can promote economic gains from environmental protection. Because we realize that there are so many sectors in the of the economy, things like tourism, that depend on the environment, things like agriculture, because if the environment is degraded, there's huge climate change impact, there's going to be re less rainfall. And when there's less rainfall, there's going to be impact on agriculture. If the forest cover is degraded, you talk about bees, the bees are going to go away, their pollution is going to decline. You can talk about issue about, you know, decline in pollinators, all of which are going to affect the ecosystem. So on that regard, you know, this day is a very important day to see how best we conserve the remaining, you know, forest covers we have. We are able to have strong policy dialogue. We are able to at least raise the awareness among our own populations so that people can, you know, increase the effort, their action towards protecting the environment. How do we also ensure we incentivize people who are the front line, who are able to protect the remaining forest cover and the remaining natural resources in our, we have in our country? How do we ensure that nature-based solutions towards putting this environment and restoring the fall lost vegetation? Yeah. Uh, Omar, um, if you stop there, you raise uh, three very important um, uh, points. I want you to, I want to go back uh, with you. Um, Dr. Marland is in, but I think he has issues with his camera. Uh, Dr. Marland, if you're um, in there, can you join in and we'll start um, uh, this closer. Omar, you mentioned um, COVID-19, like um, um, I mentioned about the positive impact, but you mentioned something that is the negative impact, like COVID-19 affected mainly people at the bottom of the social ladder, you know, um, like uh, people with underlying conditions, but how do they get those underlying conditions? Because these are the people at the margin of the society. They tend to live closer to the landfill sites, to the industrial sites. You know, what do you think um, um, the world can do to make sure that uh, those uh, conditions are, are properly addressed? Well, I'll take a clear example. I am in the US right now in Massachusetts. So if you look at places like Chelsea, these are like a small community here. They are close to the local international airport. And the number of people who have got like, you know, cancer in those areas cannot be compared to other parts of the country here. Then because of what? They are the people that are like, you know, close to the airport, you know, gas filling stations. They are the people that are like close to like, you know, landfills. So what the world can do is if you want to address the issue about environmental protection, we have to also factor in the issue of inequality and injustice. Yeah. How do we ensure if we want to put up a project, what is going to be the alpha environmental impact in terms of pollution to the nearby communities? Hmm. How do we ensure those people also are put in part of the decision making process? How do we ensure we have them, they have that prior informed consent about we don't have this type of project in your community, in your area? These are some of the potential impact environmentally, and these are part of the potential hmm. impact socially. And all of those things are part of the environmental impact assessment before you give a get-go, before you give an approval to a project for them to implement their initiative. Mm -hmm. So once yeah, a okay, um, I will... if people start having some issues about you know about, about those kind of projects, then they can raise flag. You know what? When you guys give an approval mm -hmm. to company ABC, mm -hmm. we have realized that down the line, three, four, five down mm -hmm. the line. People here have started developing some sort of like, you know, some health concern because of what maybe there are some carcinogens that are released from this particular company or this factory. Mm -hmm. This is why we need for the Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Omar, uh, for that brilliant answer. I'm going to um, welcome Omar um, Malmo, Ginio, and Farmer Adrami. Um, Omar, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. And uh, yeah, greetings farm... to you and talk. Thank you, guys. Yeah, Sorry thank you. Okay. Right. okay, Dr. Malani also is, is, is in. And Farmer's face is brighter because the Ramadan is, is finished now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, Omar, um, welcome to another uh, panel discussion. I just give uh, my brief introduction um, and I touch on the impact of the positive impact of uh, COVID 19 on, on our environment. Of course, there is a lesser greenhouse effect uh, because of all these planes and, um, and cruise ships and cars all grounded. You know, but um, um, as we wind down, as we go out of this pandemic, uh, um, what do you think is going to be the effect, you know, on on our gain, you know, gain already so far in terms of, uh, because COVID-19, you can ask, it's a godsend, but I might not want to answer that question, but it's definitely godsend as far as the environment is concerned. Have some very, very uh, positive, good positive impact on the environment. But as we go out, you know, what do you think um, this um, easing of lockdown is going to be on the environment? Omar Malmo, can you hear me? Yeah, I Hello? can hear you. Okay, so you hear my question, right? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, very well indeed. Okay, all right. So you can go ahead. Yes. So, like I said, as today marks another world in you know, uh, this is a celebration across the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the night in the 70s, I think 74, besides, and it also, you know, a great day for the environment. Like you said, you know, uh, the impacts of COVID 19. But then, after COVID 19, is all. Just that the flights will be back on, you know, industries will be back on. You know, cars will be on a normal movement. The earth will be back. To Therefore, we expect that uh, the accelerated level of ozone depletion will be causing serious, you know, environmental mm. problems. Mm. Can you hear me? Yeah, your your sound is not uh, great. Maybe you need. No, we can hear you properly. Your sound is breaking seriously. So what I'm going yeah, to I do? Why you put that out? I'm calling. Yeah, I will. I'll call on Dr. Malandin. I think you heard Omar even before your camera was on. That um, project like Eva, which is your project, and we are celebrating uh, biodiversity. He said, "How can we make so those kind of projects are sustainable?" Dr. Malandin. Well, sustainability is really a, a difficult issue when it comes to this kind of projects. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things we are trying to do is to make sure that people own the project. And, uh, you know, because there are many dimensions to it, not just to bring something to people, such as an enterprise, beekeeping units, uh, or some uh, food processing units, machines, you bring them over. You also really would have to make sure that those who are going to utilize them, those who are going to participate in them, understand how to use them. And of course, also develop the entrepreneurial part of things because really almost every venture, whether it is you know, directly business or not, has some managerial part to it. So we are trying to make sure that not just do we ensure that what people need is brought to them, but we also cultivate this idea of entrepreneurial skills. In this mm -hmm. uh, for instance, when it comes to tree planting, we know to make it sustainable, 
people must find money mm -hmm. or must must be able to make money by producing seedlings. And okay. uh, as long as that is going on, those people would continue to grow seedlings as long as somebody mm -hmm. wants it. And we want to also mm -hmm. cultivate the idea of not just the seedling. You, we mm -hmm. want to cultivate the idea of what about the protection for the seedlings, such mm -hmm. as tree guards. Because more, almost every one of us, when we buy a car, we make sure we buy an in insurance with it. Mm -hmm. So the same thing, when you really want to have a tree grown from seedling to tree, you have to get certain things into, uh, into play. Uh, such as tree guards, and uh, of course, over time there may be some innovative ways to make those mm. in the country, mm. to make them everywhere, to make them more durable. And as a result, that is also going to start a whole cottage industry of not just yeah. you know production seedlings, but uh, tree guards. And then as we move along, almost every mm. stage we want to involve the communities or at their core. Uh, for instance, we are involving uh, CBO right now to collect mm -hmm. seeds and mm -hmm. they also are supposed to engage local seed collectors so mm -hmm. we believe that by the end of the project we should have a whole mm -hmm. uh, set up a whole mm -hmm. industry really or you know mm -hmm. built around seed collection seed management mm -hmm. seed, you know mm -hmm. and you know seed trade mm -hmm. which i think you know is very genuine because if you need almost more than 10 million trees mm -hmm. per, 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 per year in the mm -hmm. gambia you can mm -hmm. expect such you know to go beyond gambia to senegal or other places mm -hmm. so essentially the involvement of the people makes certain things sustainable and their ownership not just bring mm -hmm. it to them but mm -hmm. their ownership in the design and implementation make mm -hmm. all of that possible mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank thank you very much and the other question i have for you omar malmo i'll come back to you is um the issue of combo, we have seen the proliferation of these uh, estate agents. You know, you need a you need a land or a forest cover to plant these trees. But we've seen um, the rate at which uh, these um, 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 uh, estate agents are expanding. Don't you think Gambia need a zoning um, um, a project as soon as possible to make sure that all the remaining forest covers, because it's like a race agent time. People are trying to cash in as much as possible. And the estate agents, as soon as they bought this place, they bring the bulldozers. So what is the government doing to make sure that um, this um, is, is, is arrested or is slowed down in just a little bit? Yeah, well, because there are so many moving parts to government, I cannot, as an individual at this stage, really speak for government when you say, what, what is the government okay. doing? But what I do know, there are certain there are there are certain things that that can happen and are not happening and uh, you know uh, that is from my own perspective i believe for instance uh there has been a serious serious gap you know in the way the government manages land land yeah. ownership in general you know mm -hmm. and if there is no declared owner you know mm -hmm. there is a temptation that somebody would want to have it Mm. You know, the idea of re re retaining all lands mm. on the customary land tenure mm. Mm -hmm. is a recipe for this kind of issue. Because mm. what that did in the colonial times is to avoid confrontation with the landowners. Mm. But uh, since it has been designed in such a way that whenever government wants, government comes and negotiate with who? Government mm. installed agents or government install leaders such as SAFOs uh, because mm. the chiefs and the alcalos have, have slowly become government installed. So when the mm. negotiation is between that person who has been installed by government and government, it's, mm. there, there is room for, in fact, there is hardly any room for government mm. to fail in the way mm. it will negotiate. So essentially for me, I think the biggest problem is the way land tenure is managed mm. in this country. Okay, that is that 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 is that's the one that has opened up. Mm -hmm. And secondly, you know, I think there has been a serious gap in mm -hmm. making that is government coming out, especially Ministry of Lands, mm -hmm. and letting the people know what land tenure categories mean to people mm -hmm. and for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been a lot of mention of state land, mm -hmm. and I don't think many of us know what state land is. Yes, there yeah. has been a lot of mention of lease. Mm -hmm. And I don't think many of us know really what lease means. Mm -hmm. And these are things 
concepts that need to be brought to the people because mm -hmm. these are foreign concepts. You know, our, in our old ways, it is very simple for the clan or the clan leader mm. to say they, they control the land. And mm. whoever wants it, you use it. You don't own it. You, use it yeah. you use it and let it go to the next mm -hmm. person who is coming yeah. in. But things yeah. have changed. We have now been, we are now into a modern life where ownership means something. It means wealth yeah. generation. It means, you know, future for one's kids or not the other. You know, mm -hmm. so it, I, and uh, unless and until we then let people know, especially those who are now holding much of the land on the customary tenureship, to let them know mm -hmm. that your customary tenureship is very temporal. Mm -hmm. It is not recognized by government in terms of the, mm -hmm. for you to make wealth out of land. Because mm -hmm. customary land, you cannot lease it. Customary mm -hmm. land that is uh, as an individual, you cannot take it to the bank and get mm -hmm. a mortgage out of it. And these mm -hmm. are all ways to prevent wealth mm -hmm. creation among the indigenous mm -hmm. that were devised mm -hmm. by colonial but still being maintained yeah. by the current system, yeah. which mm -hmm. is very unfortunate. And I think, and I've always argued for that, that customary land tenure should really be removed as a land tenure category in this country because it's, it's really pulling those who are holding on to it. The only thing they can do is to transfer use to the other person. And mm -hmm. that's always the case. Until you start talking about lease, then you realize that you are only there to declare occupancy. You are not really there to own mm -hmm. it. You know, and mm -hmm. that declaration of occupancy and going to lease, there is limited time that you can have it. 99 mm -hmm. years if you are citizen, uh, under our new constitution, it will be 30 years if you are foreign. But still, you know, that does not mean you own it. You know, it's mm -hmm. so, so there are many things that land ownership has not been really uh, clear to yeah. us as a population. And I think that is what the problem is. If we, I mean, combo we have done, that is we are mm. done with combo because there is not enough room anymore. But yeah. this is a situation that will continue across combo, mm. beyond combo, and perhaps, you know, one day, you know, mm. all the way to Fatoto. And uh, it is yeah. a match that I, I don't believe can be really halted by any one group right now. Yeah. 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 Um, finally, with, with you, um, recently there have been um, Chinese nationals with guns in Brufut Woods, you know, um, hunting for um, birds and probably monkeys. You know, who, who is responsible of issuing these um, uh, hunting licenses? Sorry, let me. The That's audio fine. is getting. Ah, okay. So, Omar Malmo, you can go ahead. Let me see if your if your sound is okay now. No, your 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 you are muted. Out loud speaker. Omar Malmo is moved. So, before Dr. Malan didn't come, and Omar Malmo, you are mute, right? Hello. He's not aware he's mute. Okay, Farmara. Farmara, can you hear me? Farmara. Hello, Farmara. I think he's experiencing some connection issue. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, he's. Farmara, can you hear me? Okay, so we have been problems. Uh, um, I, think, I think going back to that land issue, because you are talking about what can we do as a country. The government yeah. wants to be maybe like trying to recognize the traditional land tenure system. Let's have a hybrid yeah. system in the country, where yeah. by local communities their rights will be recognized. The government mm -hmm. provided with the documentation of their mm -hmm. property right, you know, mm -hmm. and out of that one they can be able to have the documentation to be able to like you know go to the bank, you know, be able to have the mortgage or be able to like at least even rent out their land to somebody while they mm -hmm. still maintain their legal you know ownership of the particular land. Mm -hmm. Okay. Farmara, can you hear me? Okay, I think Farmara is having. Doctor, so the question yes. I put to you last was that um, recently, about a week or so ago, um, the Chinese nationals with handguns, you know, hunting in Brufoot uh, woods. 
and in fact uh, the locals called the one military officer they went there and they apprehend them take them to the alkali the alkali is there gone and i don't know what's the latest that's what i want a farmer to update it but who is responsible do you know who is responsible of issuing this um uh, hunting um 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 uh, license and also you know in combo not much is left if they kill all the birds we might as well um, um, uh, close our tourism sector because we have seen what the fish meal have done to the tourism sector now that the Chinese are out killing the remaining wildlife. I don't know who is responsible of issuing those um, uh, uh, hunting licenses and what can we do to make sure that it is stopped? Well, yeah, I mean, suddenly I, I was also alarmed and uh, oh. unfortunately I cannot tell you who is actually responsible for issuing, okay. uh, that is, who must have been responsible for issuing them the license if they had any at all. Uh, but I am assuming that if they said they had license, uh, they would have produced it. And if they did, uh, the folks there who apprehended them should by now know who actually issued the license, whether it is the Department of Parks and Wildlife or yeah. not. Uh, again, it is definitely alarming that we have hunting as close to, uh, I would say, com I mean, in Combo in general, much more the, a, a park that is uh, a Ramsa park, you know, we're very much known for birds that are exotic and often they are, they are, they are migratory. So all of that really suddenly uh, is alarming and I sincerely believe that they, we should follow up to the point where we know exactly what happened. You know, as far as the, the local action is concerned, I think that is commendable. You know, I mean, there are many mm, yeah. things that, that are happening that government cannot take control of. The mm. government cannot mm. keep an eye on because there isn't the capacity within government to do that, those things. Mm. So I, I will say for such things, I commend the, the, the community, let them push forward let them ensure that mm. such an issue mm. is addressed in courts, not just outside mm. courts, because courts sometimes outside have courts. power, you know. So mm. essentially that's where I believe, I mean, we should push it. And if they can, they, they, they should follow it all the way to the end. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Let me see if, because Farmara was on this case. Farmara, can you hear me? Hello, Farmara. No, we can't hear you. I think farmer is having issues. No, we can't hear you. We can't. We, hello? We we can we can hear you. Okay. So farmer is having problem just like Omar um, the other week. Um we can hear him. Okay, so Omar. Yes. Yes, um, this um, year's team is about celebrating biodiversity. And Gambia, we've seen increasingly, you know, last uh, two or three weeks ago, Dr. Malandi mentioned something which I was not paying attention, but as soon as he mentioned it, it rings some bell to me. You know, the, we know the big um, wildlife, almost um, all of them are gone. But the small ones, you know, when I first returned to the Gambia around 2006, if you drive even the Combo Coastal Road, you you catch your headlights, catch um, uh, rabbits sometimes, and sometimes these are uh, dicks. But hardly, you know, I see them anymore, even in Gunju. You know, I can remember uh, during my last visit, I've seen a squirrel or, or, or rabbit or, um, you know. So what do you think we can do to make so that um, we restore, if these things are there, to um, restore their, their, these uh, local uh, population of these um, uh, small rodents? Well, I think we have a lot that can be done. One thing can be like you know, environmental education. We have to educate the citizens about the importance of the remaining you know, biodiversity cover resources we have in the country, because it is our own local people from the community level who always goes out down there for one reason or the other to go and hunt down this species. You know, I was in the Gambia in 2017, you know, hardly you see a bush buck antelope. But way back in 2015 or way back in 2011 or early, you know, late 90s, anywhere in Gunju, between Gunju 
towards cart or between Gunjur to Berendi or Gunjur coastline area towards Sanya area. If he goes out in the morning for hunting, you can see bush buck trails. You can see fox trails. You can see all the wild animal trails in the bush. But right now, it is very hard to see all those kind of species because of what, you know, habitat degradation. Their habitat is very, very limited because of, of the development. So one aspect will be like we have to educate our own citizens about the importance of protecting the remaining, you know, biodiversity cover. The government also has to ensure they enforce the policies. If somebody default in killing or in gunning down one of those wildlife species, let them at least enforce the law till later. The other thing might be like we also need to at least increase our protected area zones. You know, we have Abuka Nejo Reserve, we have Tanje Bar Reserve, but are we, you know, well, okay, we did the definition of the boundaries. How do we and so we protect those areas too? That the animals inside down, if it does not encroach into those protected areas to go and kill them down. If an animal also leaves the protected area zone, how do we ensure they are safely guided to go back into the protected area? You know, how do we also ensure we do at least a periodic counting or a censorship, sensor, census of this species? So these are all some of the things that the government can do at national level and at also community level. We have to also work in close collaboration with community-based organizations, whereby people who are going to be like, you know, in Gunjur, in Basse, in Fatwoto, in Jarasoma, in Wuli, in some areas, whereby they can at least report a sighting of key of the animal species in those areas too. And then once they cite something, they can also have a close contact with the Department of Parks and Wildlife Management or even some of the, you know, other departments in the country that have at least oversight mandate about the protection of those you know, species too in the country. Thank you very much, uh, Omar, um, for that. Um, Lamin Jobati is, uh, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a bad uh, interest. He, you know, he was on this case that he said uh, there are two types of lines. It's according to director or Dep director of department of parks and wildlife that is domestic and police licenses so that wapsa inquiry recently in connection with uh Bruford woods you know lamin jabate if you can call the whatsapp you can elaborate on this that will be interesting let me try again if i can hear farmer farmer can you hear me okay farmer um you've been on this case about the chinese hunting in Bruford woods um what what is the information you get who gave them the permission or the license to go and hunt there uh -oh. we can hear farmer can you hear no, no farmer we can we can hear you unfortunately we we can hear you yeah sorry about that um yeah, Farmara would have uh, given us a better um, explanation, you know. But um, coming uh, back right. to yeah. moving up from that, you know, Chinese, Chinese hunting. You know, a couple of weeks ago, there was this killing of um, uh, of a heap or somewhere around, you know, Janjambore area. One of my yeah. colleagues, you know, who is a youth activist down in Janjambore, also sent the mm -hmm. same photo. So it's like it's becoming a pattern, a trajectory, you know, that people can just go about kill a particular wildlife species in the country and they go free with that one. There is some alarm on the social media, but what yeah. as well as usually comes out of it, nobody have an idea about it. So if it's become a pattern that you know what well, you can just go down there, kill an animal, and then you go walk away with it. Well, nobody's gonna care about it. It's 2020. So I think right now, Gambian people, you know, across everywhere in the community, we need to have a protocol in place, we need to have a system in place whereby if you do something that does not go in line with the policies of the land, then at least you pay for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Omar, um, this is something that uh, find its way. The story was on uh, all forestry platform. I think Dr. Marland, in fact, one comment uh, you put there, I was always going to ask you about um, if we can have uh, salt sufficiency in rice production. I think you have a different opinion on that. But um, this is a, is a delicate act because people have to live, people have to farm. And I think increasingly, um, because of salt water intrusion, the, the, the hippos have been pushing yes. off, um, off forward. So how can we, it's a question of how can we make sure hippos have um, enough space to, 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 to graze, and, but they, don't, they are protected from uh, going into people's farms. 
Uh, probably Dr. Malanding um, is familiar with this. Uh, what do you think, you know, can, can the government do, or is it the Department of Parks and Wildlife or the Forestry Department and Agriculture Department? What do you think they can do to make sure that this um, human-wildlife uh, uh, conflict is amicably resolved? Uh, that's a very difficult question. I mean, uh, and a very good one. Uh, the, reali the, the, the reality is that we, the only thing we can do for us, as far as I mean, sectors are concerned, i.e. agriculture, uh, forestry, lands, yeah. and central government in general, really is to agree. Yeah. And agree on a policy that strikes a balance, a balance between what is desirable, that is for everybody, including li livestock, uh, wildlife, and what is possible. You know, I mean, because the thing is, it is desirable to have wildlife everywhere, as far as wildlife are concerned, but that is not possible. The same thing with uh, when it comes to human beings. What I do need, uh, what I would want people to understand, though, is that this policy of right self-sufficiency, I, I would want people to investigate its origin. Where does it really yeah. come from? Why? Okay. Why? Do, how? 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 How do we just find ourselves into that? Is it because we cannot separate ourselves with rice, or it has been someone's aspiration that has been passed on to us, and at yeah. a point now we are just carrying somebody's aspiration? You know, I mean, as far as I know, you know, it it is something that was doable in the sixties. You know, because when you look back in the sixties. Yeah. You had sufficient water water resources mm -hmm. in that country, fresh water resources for that matter, mm -hmm. and it is from I would say yeah. from Balimo, you know, all the way up country. Yeah. There was no doubt that you will have fresh water all year round, you know. And not only that, yeah. our, physio phys uh, our, our 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 physiography, i.e., the way the land forms are in this in that country, is that every part of the country is connected to the sea directly. Yeah. There is no barrier between Fatoto and the sea or Galemanda and the sea, technically. Yeah. The reason I, br I bring in Galemanda is that it's on the fringe, on the edge of the country. But yeah. when you think about it, sea water goes all the way to Basse, all the way to yeah. Fatoto. That is the yeah. sea's influence. So the only yeah. thing that is preventing salt from getting there is there is enough fresh water. Yeah. But climate is not allowing that. And uh, our use, population use, population size, and uh, agricultural activities are not allowing enough fresh water in that country. And that is the reason why we have, over the last 50 years, seen a migration of almost 100 kilometers okay. of, the, of the salt water front. You know, okay. from, from Balingo all the way past Kaur. And yeah. you know, as, as, uh, and as you would imagine, every other land area along that bank and beyond has salt contamination. Mm -hmm. If you go to if you go to uh, Nyamina today, Dankunku, those areas that were at one time potent, I mean huge rice fields are now mm -hmm. mangrove land or salt flats. And uh, you know, the same thing with Katamina, the same, you know. So those are areas that were at one time, 50 years ago, never thought of. Mm -hmm. People never thought that they would we would have mangroves in there. Mm -hmm. You know, so the reality is that the area that is potential agricultural land is shrinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, especially the rice land is shrinking fast mm -hmm. at, at, at a rate that is totally uh, is unsustainable, mm -hmm. and we don't have any means but to tap more water from the same river. All we are doing is accelerating that process. So I, mm -hmm. I, I I'm of the opinion, and I really st strongly believe that. Mm -hmm. You know, rice of self-sufficiency should be out of our food. We should aim for food self-sufficiency, yes. And mm -hmm. we can do that if we look up to other areas other than the fresh water that is so little oh. and dwindling. Okay, you know. thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you say that, because that's the belief I'm living on, I say, why well, why are our politicians that are useless? They will come with this and it's not attainable. But it's good you give that technical um, 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 answer. Um, Farmer, can you hear me now again? Yeah, I can hear you. Now, okay, now I can hear you clearly. Uh, okay, Farmer. Yes. What 
what happened with uh, the the Chinese guy they arrested in your forest? Do you manage to speak to the Department of Parks and Wildlife uh, people? Actually, um, first of all, Happy World Environment Day. You know, I mean, it's beautiful to have this order every year. Uh, yeah. June fifth to celebrate this particular day uh, because the United mm. Nations has set this day aside uh, 46 mm. years ago in 1974. The 1972 mm. Stockholm Conference on Human and Environment. Uh, since then, mm. you know, it is it's a way of reminding each other, reminding our government uh, some mm. of the international convention agreements that we sign as a country, um, that mm. we, we owe an obligation as a country, but also um, to educate our citizens on um, environmental mm. sustainability, because mm. environment is so, so important. Uh, the water we drink, the food we eat, and the air we breathe is all dependent on the environment. So if we destroy mm. our environment, it will be very, very difficult for we human beings to actually, mm. you know, survive, you know, with the mm. our, our existence on this planet. Mm. So coming to your question, mm. actually, I left the issue with um, uh, the executive director of WAPSA. I've not been in mm. touch with uh, the Parks and Wildlife, but we have a group forum where the director mm. is and some of the wildlife staff are including Mr. Jawada mm. himself. So um, Jawada mm. promised to take up the matter with the Department of Parks and Wildlife. But what I can tell you mm. from the community level, um, the community ranger that works at Brookwood Woods um, actually mm. was the guy who confiscated uh, the firearms from this Chinese national and then took them mm. to the village Alcalo uh, with the help mm. of our, one of our, our military uh, or our army officer. You know, they the one mm. who jointly um, arrested these people and took them to mm. um, to the Alcali's um, um, residence. Mm. So I yeah. think uh, Alcali couldn't make a decision at that time. I think it was a little bit late. So they asked the Chinese nationals to come back the following morning. And But uh, as we understand, the following morning, their firearms were returned back to them. And then I understand they came with one somebody uh, who claimed to be a police officer. And then the police officer pleaded on their behalf um, uh, uh, at the Alcali. So I think based on that, and um, they said it was their first time they committed such an offense. Um, so, and they did not even kill anything at the time. Um, so they asking for mercy um, instead of taking the matter to the police. So I think uh, the Alcalo also acted, um, you know, without consulting the BDC because we have um, um, uh, a subcommittee on environment um, mm. under the BDC, you know, who mm. are actually responsible for enforcing laws uh, because mm -hmm. they catch a um, lot of people they caught a lot of people um, violating the law in the community forest so usually mm -hmm. they come together and then you know levy fines on anybody who violates the law so in this case mm -hmm. the alcalo acted acted you know um in, a, in 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 isolation you know he 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 take up the decision by himself by releasing those um you know mm -hmm. poachers you know and then returning their fire uh, firearms to them without consulting the BDC. So as of now, I'm not quite sure um, whether the Chinese nationals are coming back or the case is closed, I don't know. But as far as we know, it's not even a time for hunting right now. And then, you know, when you're keeping hunting out, um, the, the hunting is usually done in areas, not in like community forests or protected areas. These are mm. outside, they are open areas where uh, mm. hunting is supposed to be conducted. Mm. So in this yeah. case, uh, what we want to find out from Department of Parks and Wildlife, whether these people were allowed to hunt in, in Bruford Woods, which obviously in our case, they're not supposed to allow to, to do that. So this was supposed to be a joint enforcement between the Parks and Wildlife, the community, and then also uh, Department of Parks and Wildlife, and then the Alcala. Yeah, so that's the case right now. So I'm not sure um, exactly, but also we did not even verify um, they are licensed, but they claim that they have already got approval from the Department of Parks and Wildlife to hunt. But then the conditions of the license and then also where to um, hunt, that is not very clear. That's something that we have to actually um, determine. And that can only be verified at the Parks and Wildlife. Yeah. Uh, Farmer, thanks for that update. You know, Dr. Malandi was <laughs> suggesting, which I think is the right thing. You know, these things cannot be negotiated at Alcalo's level. I think we should start uh, prosecuting. We heard um, the, the uh, Frisis ministry the other day that um, they actually negotiate out of court settlement with the trollers they catch, you know, um, in our seats. 
and then they will uh, share the the the, the proceed of, of the fine uh, they decided between themselves between uh, the fiscal ministry and the i don't think that is right i think uh, you should encourage your guys you know if they caught these people let them you know take them to police and let them be charged you know we cannot have like foreign nationals you know just taking guns and go into our local forests and start hunting you know, Dr. Marlon, they mentioned, Tom, I think we have a serious issue with uh, smaller, even, and we know the bigger ones are for all, 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 of, all of them have done. But you look at the rabbit discoveries, I think there are numbers, you know, we need to do sort of like a, a census, you know, to next to, in fact, if, if they are even there. You know, what do you think we need to do to revive uh, the population of our small um, um, uh, wildlife uh, uh, population? Yeah, actually, I understand the, the lion scene was given to hunt birds and small rodents. And it's been a long time since we had our national biodiversity assessment. So we don't even know um, the, the animals we have. Um, so I think at this point, we should not even be um, encouraging people to um, actually be hunting, you know, unless we know the status of our biodiversity, especially mm -hmm. the birds. The birds are some of the avifauna is mm -hmm. one of the a big attraction for Gambia right now because most of the tourists that are coming to Gambia um, are bird watchers. They want to come and look at our birds. So, mm -hmm. and these uh, people are killing every every species of birds. They kill the, the pigeons, they kill the other species of birds as well. You know, and then, you know, I mean, I don't think um, we should allow as a country right now, you know, to be even entertaining, um, you know, giving hunting license for people to go and hunt or shoot at birds. I don't think we are because the essence of giving permit is um, when we have a lot of vermin species, um, especially um, the falcochero species, which is the bushpeak or white hawk, you know, um, in, in the central river region and also in the mm -hmm. North Bank, where the population mm -hmm. of bushpeaks are a little bit high, you know. Mm -hmm. So, in order to do some management um, activity, um, so what they do is just give license to uh, people to go and hunt so that they can reduce the population of um, these bush peaks so that mm. the pressure on agriculture um, could be reduced, you know. Mm. But we have, Gambia is such a small country. Right now we have nearly about 10 or 12 hunting camps uh, spread across the country. And most of these hunting camps are run by um, Spanish and the Portuguese and then the French nationals, you know. And then most of the tourists come in, they are coming through Senegal. So the firearms they are bringing in they are not even accounted for by the Gambia government. So these are uh, firearms that are actually the tourists come along uh, into the country through Senegal, and then they will drive across our border and spend like three to four days to one week in the Gambia, and then you know go on a hunting trip, you know, in community farmlands. So we have received a lot of various complaints from communities that they've seen people coming in their farmlands, you know, hunting. You know, and they do hear gunshots frequently. So I think uh, the, the the issue of the hunting is not very controlled in our country. Uh, I think now um, it is time, just like the timber trade, we also do away with this hunting um, business, and then maybe give license to our local people. You know, in case they want to um, reduce the um, the number of vermin species in their environment, they can control mm -hmm. it. They can suit it. Mm -hmm. But these French people don't really give up because they're there to hunt uh, for mm. fun. You know, they kill mm. as much as they can. There is no control. Even though they are given a quota, each hunting camp is given a quota of how many species you can hunt or kill. But sometimes they, they don't respect that because there is no effective monitoring. You know, so, I mean, our biodiversity are the threat now if we don't control um, this hunting business. Yeah, Farmara, thank you very much for that extensive um, uh, presentation. I don't think, uh, I think that's something also our tourism sector should um, consider, should look into, because if people are hosting in Senegal, just come to Gambia to hunt, I don't think they are doing much for our tourism sector. If they are in the Gambia, then go and hunt in the Gambia. We know that they are contributing into uh, the employment and also they are spending. But coming from Senegal and coming, I think that should be uh, really, really looking into. And when it comes to health and safety, I don't think it is safe to hunt with guns anywhere in the compass. You know, I think Dr. Marlon did mention something uh, about that. So, uh, we've already uh, passed the time uh, limit for this program, right. but.
we are struggling to get in. So I'm going to start with your closing remark. This um, year's celebration is marked with two significant things. That is COVID-19 and also the, the, the riot across the world because this is beyond American borders now. What do you think of uh, these two um, uh, major uh, events, like the pandemic and the uh, race riot we are seeing and we are not seeing the end of it now, is going to have on um, 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 our biodiversity? Yeah, I think the, um, the biodiversity, I mean, this COVID-19 is something that we should all learn from uh, because uh, since the beginning of the year, we have seen the, uh, the bush fires in Australia you know, we mm. destroyed a lot of uh, biodiversity. Thousands mm. of species have been lost mm. through um, mm. this uh, wildfire. And then we have mm. also seen in South America, uh, these volcanic eruptions. Mm. And we mm. have also seen in East, um, um, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, the numerous floods and natural disasters. And also in, in, in East Africa, we have seen the locals invasion, you know. So all of these have threatened our biodiversity. So if there's something that we can learn from this is to um like the team for this year is time for nature we need to um create time for nature we need to uh put nature into our consideration and then respect our national laws and and our international conventions that we agreed and signed upon so i think this is very very important because biodiversity um mm. like you said is a variety among um, mm. life organisms or life um in mm. general so it could mm. be ecosystem diversity, uh, which mm. includes the uh, various diversity we have in our ecosystem, like terrestrials, uh, water mm. bodies, uh, rainforests, mm. and all those stuff mm. like that. And we have mm. the, you know, the uh, the genetic diversity, the diversity within, you know, species, you know, mm. and the ecosystem diversity. So all mm. of this is related to um, we the humans because we cannot go um, with clean environment, clean water. Mm. Mm. and then clean air to, and then uh, the COVID-19 uh, we have mm. seen uh, Madagascar for example they have come up with um, you know um, a cure or maybe uh, you know a medication that they believe can cure COVID-19 mm. which comes from the biodiversity so mm. you can see um, unless we do research and on, unless we actually protect our environment some of the species that we apply might more be available as a medicinal value for us yeah. so yeah, yeah. And, and also the ecosystem that we protect today you know yeah. will protect us from natural disasters you know especially yeah. us in the developing countries in africa yeah. whereby yeah. you know during rainy season the wind yeah. storms you know are very intense and are very yeah. frequent during the rainy season yeah. and then yeah. if you don't live in a very good house i mean the chances that you know the wind storm will blow over your house you know, um, or your, 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 our, our cities will be flooded, like we've seen in mm. Banjo, in, mm. in, you know, Serekunda and the KMC area during the rainy season. It's, it's so. So nature is something that we cannot do away with. It is part of mm. us, and we are part yeah. of nature. So the yeah. more we destroy nature, we are actually mm. destroying ourselves. And we mm. are actually threatening our own existence mm. on this mm. planet. So mm. we are, we are interrelated. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Marlon, this one, um, I'm going to give, um, this one is from one of the viewers here. Uh, two, two, two questions. One of them, um, no, this was just as um, a contribution. He said uh, about, issue about um, this estate agent. He said, open shop offices in every major town with access to the central database. I don't think we have that in the Gambia. If you are selling, buying a land, the sales will, will not be completed without their approval. This will, over, this will, over, will help overseas alcalos and individual sellers. What do you, what's your take on that? Well, well again, uh, those are all very good measures to control the mm -hmm. process. But uh, what we must really understand is that the appearance or the prol proliferation of uh estate agents is possible because there is environment for it i.e yeah. they came out they are able to su succeed they're able to grow because there is room for them to come out and grow uh yeah. in the sense that there is land to, to, to for, for sale or there is land to buy and yeah. uh, as long as there is land to sell and buy there would always be a, a middle person you know and yeah. one of the things that we must recognize as a cardinal uh, 
I would say, role for government is uh, in terms of deciding what land is used for what. Mm. That is a very central role of government that has been lost over the years because uh, mm. land everywhere, if it is on the mm. Ministry of Lands, the mm. uses should be, I mean, every use should be considered. Okay. You know, it is not only to, for use by who want to put a house on it or who want mm. to put an industrial park on it. It should mm. be what is the land useful for? Mm. What is the most appropriate use for the land? What is the most economical use for the land? What is the most ecologically sound use for the land? Those mm. questions must be answered by the Ministry of Land, that is the, 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 the more or less the custodians of all land. Right, and yeah. when that is established, there are mm -hmm. rules of the game that if you want to own it, yes, and if it falls under your house, it's yours, take it. Mm -hmm. But as mm -hmm. far as movement is concerned from one use to the other, you must mm -hmm. come to us and take permission. Mm -hmm. You must come. Mm -hmm. And uh, essentially what has been lost, and I, my, this is my observation, is that mm -hmm. Ministry of Land, especially physical planning, most mm -hmm. of their role is to, to find a place for settlement. Yeah. They, and and even those areas that they marked in the 80s as not suitable for settlement, they have mm. abandoned ro those rules. You mm. know, the 1986 or 87 land use map of, of Gambia, if you look at it now, and in fact, if mm. it was allowed to exist, we will still have almost 60% of the land mm. unsettled in common. Yeah. But it has been abandoned and there is no... Not, I mean, if it is it's abandoned through policy change or it is abandoned through some uh, uh, human, I would say, influence, you yeah. know, unfortunately, we cannot roll back the clock. So uh, the estates are really not, they have really little to do with this. Okay. The estates are only there because there is buying and selling. Buying and selling if there yeah. is no buying and selling, they would leave. Mm -hmm. they, are going, they would go for something else. So business in general is only there because the environment is good for it. So mm -hmm. I would say... One of the things we must focus on, and we mm. must try and regain as as mm. as government, is mm. the ability to say land for this particular area, of this particular area can only mm. be used for A, B, or C. Yeah. C that or zoning C. must be there. The policy must be there, and there has to be another part of physical planning, mm. you know, and that is spatial planning. It's not just okay. physical planning. Yeah, it has yeah. to be spatial, spatial planning in that in that everything that needs to be on the surface has to be considered, not just yeah. ha roads House. and houses, but uh, it has to go yeah. beyond that. And I think yeah. that is something that is missing. And mm. it has unfortunately fall, I mean, such in terms of putting or caring for wildlife has fallen on the, on who? Ministry of Lands, uh, Ministry mm. of Environment, mm. who don't have the land. You know, they only declare areas after so much haggling, after so much struggle, in order to get a land declared on the, you know, as as as, as a park. And mm. even that, you know, Ministry of Land can still come back with mm. the, with their authority and say, well, we are going to de we we want you to de reserve mm. it so that we can yeah. use it for A, B, C, and D. So mm. Ministry of Land's role suddenly is a very powerful role in land management, mm. and it has unfortunately really not been the way or the advanced countries or the successful countries have managed their yeah. land. And yeah. if we want to become one of those successful countries, we want mm. to really be successful in terms of how we even survive, you know, mm. in, a, in, a, in a global change world, we mm. must adhere to some of those principles okay. as a country. And suddenly the Ministry of Land must adhere to the land use policy principle, mm. land use map, master plan principle must come in again. I don't know mm. when that is going to happen, but mm. the longer it stays out, the more problems we, are fa we will face yeah. in the future. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Malani. Just one minute of your time. Um, if all trees belong to the state, why then these estate agents, once they bought a place, they bring a bulldozer and just clear all the trees? You know, why they don't consult the state or they are asked to go and plant some amount of trees somewhere? Well, you know, I'll be blunt about this. Yeah, uh, most most real estate agents don't get land without going to uh, physical planning for endorsement and approval yeah. or yeah. ministry of lands. Mm -hmm. And endorsement and approval does not mean, oh, I'm going to get my land so that I can leave the trees there. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to get this land so that I can put houses there. Yeah. Yeah. So once that stamp is put on their paper, I mean, they, they don't have to care about what a bird or some uh, tree lover or tree hugger would want to really say or do. Yeah. They paid their money and, and they got the legal papers and legal endorsement at the highest level. So yeah. nobody should stand in their way. And this is really one unfortunate part of it. Yeah. So wow. if they, we are to prevent such a thing from happening, mm -hmm. we have to prevail over those who give them the permission mm -hmm. to, 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 to consider other users, to make sure there is room for other users, not just the one who is going to put you know, corrugated steel or concrete buildings. I mean, so. really look at look at those areas that we have already established without thinking. Mm. I mean, uh, Bundung is the example for me. For mm. me, I really look at Bundung. I say, let's look at Bundung. There isn't a single, you know, one kilometer square there. Mm. In fact, we don't have a 250 by 250 space where you can have a park. 250 meters by 250 meters in Bundung, mm. none. There no. is no room to put another football field. There is no room to put up another hospital of yeah. a real serious hospital like the one you are working in. There yeah, is no yeah. room for that. Neither yeah, is there no. any room for government offices, governments. No. Yeah. So at the end of the day, when you are tired and and, and stuff and really yeah. hot in your room, where do you go yeah. in Bundo? Yeah, Nowhere. No. Yeah, so the, so the standard of living in Bundo would deteriorate as more yeah. population come in. Mm -hmm. And that, that is unfortunate because population will continue to increase. Mm -hmm. You know, there will be that densification will continue in Bundung. And mm -hmm. the longer that says, the more, I mean, terrible the life in Bundung would be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is not going to be only Bundung. By the time Bundung feels it, Central Brikama will feel it. Central mm -hmm. Brufut will feel it. You know, mm -hmm. and the extended new areas would feel mm -hmm. it because mm -hmm. there is no room for recreation. There is no room for you know, amenity. There is no room for health. Even basic health cannot be achieved in Bundo yeah. because there is no room to walk mm. the aisles or to walk the side side sidewalks. There is no yeah. room. Yeah. You know, so yeah, we, we, are, we are setting ourselves, you know, yeah, sorry, we, but we are, we, self, we, we are setting ourselves up for a very serious problem in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, you know, we are anyway, not even okay. the present, we have a serious problem. Just to announce, um, this debate will continue on Tuesday at the same time. Uh, Walt, um, Olson Day, and Farmara will be presenting. Farmara, I will give you the closing remarks for today. But before that, I want to go to Omar. Um, again, from Abu Wakar Jami. He said there should be a uh, concern in the lines in who give lines and to who. You know, th there should be a form of post lines in each one's regulation and monitoring. That includes registering animals being killed. You know, what's your take on that? Is that practicable in the Gambia? Omar, can you hear me? Uh, that's who? Who is it for? Pardon? Omar, it's for Omar. Omar, Omar, Sao. Hello? Hello, yes. Can you hear me? You mean like post lancing issue regulation and monitoring in the Gambia? Yeah. Well, I think in that particular aspect, you might get the regulatory agency, either the Gambia Police Force or Department of Parks and Wildlife Management, for them to be able to at least have a strong contact with the people that they are issuing the lancing to, to ensure they report back to them that how many animals do they keep in a particular month or in a particular week or in a particular year, so at least we can keep an account of how things are going. Because once you give your license to somebody, there's no protocol for to monitor and evaluate whether they are doing things in the right way or not, then we are actually setting up ourselves for a failure. So that is something that the Department mm -hmm. of Public and Management can do if they are the one issuing the license. If it is the Gambia mm -hmm. Police for doing the license, that they get a special unit whereby somebody can investigate or at least, you know, they can report back to them about the number of parts that they have killed. And one way that they can do is, you know, if you did this forensic studies, you look at some of these movies, you know, if a gun is shot, you can know actually a gun is shot. But actually, whether they mm -hmm. kill it or not, this is where you have the indignity aspect of it. So it's kind of very hard, but I think there are people out there who have the expertise to be able to implement that. Yeah, thank you very much. So, Farmer, for the closing remark, today we are here, it's World Environmental Day, and the team is celebrating biodiversity, and this is your area. Just, um, a, quick can you... huh? Just a quick snapshot about the land issue and in this real estate development in the country. I think what the government can do is 
ranging from the Department of Lands and uh, Fiscal Planning, they have to ensure not all those people who pay the land expertise for the background have to work in this institution, but they have to try to recruit ecologists, environmentalists who at least go with them. If they want to map out a real estate you know, zone for a particular community, they have environmentalists inside of their perspective. How can they at least demarcate you know, 15 meters, 10 meters from the road area, whereby they can have at least a landscape development? What type of trees can we put down there? In developed countries, how they do the things? How can we have like ecological corridors whereby wildlife species in those areas can also cross mm -hmm. over human settlements? Mm -hmm. So this is very important. We talk about the, you know, who's you know, hunting in the Gambia. We have, a, and so we stop that in the Gambia right now. We talk about health and safety aspect of that one. It's not safe because Gambians mm -hmm. are running in and out of some of this, you know, open forests in the country. Why not we protect our national parks in the country? We do have Senegal in Senegal by, you know, promoting local Cuban national park, you know, Fatal national park. We can do the same thing in the Gambia. Rest mm -hmm. restore can lie. Let's restore the West National Park, reintroduce some of the wildlife species that can survive in our, you know, at least in our habitats in the country. That way, we can also promote tourism in the Gambia because right now we only promote about 570 species of birds in the Gambia. Mm. You know, stories come down to the Gambia for their vacation, but they have to travel to Senegal for the safari experience. So, this is where Gambia is also losing a lot of money from our economy. We should not only look at how much our know, hotels are gaining from tourism, but how much our national parks are having from tourism, how much our tour guides are having from tourism, and how much our department of you know parks and wildlife is also having from tourism from their you know taxes that they also led on this national park services in the country. Mm. And one way yeah, yeah. that we revitalize our tourism economy is we really introduce some of the exotic species we have in the country that have actually virtually gone extinct. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much, Omar, for that. I think concerning uh, your statement about physical planning, that's what Dr. Amini should be more than just physical planning. They should be considering what should be in the, any particular land, not only the physical structures. You know, farmer, are closing remarks in two, uh, two minutes maximum. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, uh, our biodiversity is declining very seriously. We all know that. Um, unless we do our national biodiversity assessment again, uh, we will not know how much we've got left with. But clearly, uh, most of our mammal species are gone. Uh, the hippos are the only big one we've got left with now. We don't have lions anymore. Um, you know, we don't have other big animals in the Gambia. So our biggest attraction um, is birds. So um, we should not allow uh, people to be killing birds, you know, because that's our biggest attraction right now. As much as we are a small country, we have over 65 species, 640 species, 650 species of birds right now. So that is a very, very big attraction for us, and it's attracting a lot of tourists to our country, so we should not lose uh, that side, that fact. I mean, um, we can allow hunting of big animals like the, um, the vermin species that are destroying the crops. Yeah, but that has to be done in a sustainable manner. Uh, we don't have to give away... Um, license rampantly, especially to foreign nationals. And definitely we don't need 12 hunting camps in the Gambia. You know, we don't have that biodiversity. Mm. So I think the Ministry mm. of Parks and Wildlife should look into that, you know, to, um, to close all those hunting camps. And then instead mm. of creating hunting camps, what we can do is we can give license to local people in villages um, who are really wants to hunt, you know, those boost pigs or maybe, um, you know, to kill other animals that are destroying their crops instead of bringing these foreign nationals to our country yeah. and they are making money because they pay their money all the way in france before they even come to the gambia because this hunting yeah. camps they already have their website so people book their visits well before they even come to the country or when they come to yeah. senegal so the trip they are paying for hunting in gambia includes their um, their accommodation but also includes their travel from senegal because most of this hunting camps pick them up, you know, from Senegal, or they have a tour operator that they work with that will drive them from Senegal all the way to Gambia. And when they come, they have their own hunting camps, you know, where these tourists will stay for three to four days, you know, and then, of course, they are employing some few Gambians, but we are losing. Our biodiversity mm. is lost and not yeah. many people are, mm. are being um, employed. Mm. And just to add on what Dr. Mm. Uh, Malandi was saying about real estate components, I think this is the time uh, the National Environment Agency or the Ministry work with the local government. If they are issuing development permits, when they are issuing land to people, or any development permit taking out place in the, let us make sure environmental component is included in their in their scrutiny. 
because this is what is happening now. People who buy land from real estate companies, and most of these areas, like in Combo in Gunjur, you know, these are areas that are very, you know, very, very um, um, highly ecological sensitive areas with a lot of biodiversity. So all of a sudden, the real estate company will just wake up, bulldoze all those areas, cut down all the trees we have, all the run farm trees, you know, and then without going through the due process of the law, which they have to go through the National Environment Agency to take a permission so that if they destroy any trees, um, that equivalent of the trees that they bulldoze, bulldoze should be paid to the government or to the local communities or to the CBOs to, pl to plant trees elsewhere. But these real estate companies are getting away with environmental destruction. So they can buy their mm -hmm. land, bulldoze all the trees that we planted 30 years ago, 50 years ago, and then get away with it without any compensation. So I think that is a big loss to our government. It's a big loss to our country because we invested a lot of time and energy you know, to plant those trees only to be bulldozed by a real estate company who only pay maybe a few hundred dollars to, for a development permit no. and then disregard no. all the efforts that have been done. So we are no, actually no. destroying more than we are planting now. And then if the trend continue like that, um, the combos will be destroyed very seriously and there will be no. seen increase in natural disasters uh, like no. flooding and windstorm in, in the combos. And then the temperature is getting hot in Gambia. You know, even mm -hmm. in Gunjur, where it used to be very cold, in Brufut, where it used to be very mm -hmm. cold back in the days, now we are even feeling the mm -hmm. heat. It's because our environment yeah. is destroyed. We don't have trees mm -hmm. around anymore. So mm -hmm. I think those are very important issues to discuss. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Farmara. Thank you, Dr. Malanding. And thank you, Omar Gazi, uh, Omar Sao. And unfortunately, Omar Malmo, Konidianos. Uh, thank you once again for your effort and Dr. Malanding, good, good luck with your EVA project. At least uh, that's one thing we can all celebrate that something has been done that uh, we believe it will be successful and it will bring back uh, some of the uh, loss um, 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 biodiversity that we lost especially in, in, in terms of trees. Thank you once again for coming to Gunjur News. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessed with the mighty Atlantic Ocean, fertile agricultural lands, and a strategic geographic location that gives an opportunity for a lot of people to explore and get into the business. Gunjur and the Gambia at large has experienced uh, numerous uh, shutdowns when it comes to economy, and especially this COVID time. Please join us as we embark on a journey where we explore different areas of our business sector, from agriculture, fisheries, and small business enterprises. Gunjur business is in short called Gunjur Biz. This will be a platform that we will use to explore different business opportunities, especially for young people. We'll bring you on Gunjur Online all the business topics that is related to financing, operations, marketing. And we will use this platform to invite experts from different sectors of the gambling economy and give tips and have a broader analysis of the general business sector. This will give us an opportunity to be able to discuss in a broader detail how businesses are affected when it comes to our environment, our natural resources being exploited by other people, but also how we can tap into the opportunities and also access capital, which is very crucial for the success of the businesses. But not only that, we won't stop at accessing capital. You know what else we're going to do? It's about the little operational processes that are needed in our business culture to build up culture that is going to be successful. And that's going to be most importantly what it's going to be sustainable for the success of the business. So we can transfer wealth. We can also transfer skills from one person to another to be able to live in a community that is thriving, a community that businesses, private sector, individual businesses, no job, entrepreneurship, and reward them. So please join me every week on Guju Online as we delve into all these areas of discussions when it comes to business success. This is your host of the of Control Online. Thank you for joining us.